good afternoon, everyone. My name is Toby Driver. I'm from the Royal Commission on Ancient Monuments in Wales. Uh, and I'm talking this afternoon with my project colleague, Rob Shaw, from the Discovery Program in Ireland. Uh, at ARG, we don't often hear about uh, Ireland in the context of aerial photography uh, and airborne remote sensing and drone surveys. So it's a really good opportunity to come here uh, today to talk to you about how we deploy these techniques within our EU-funded Cherish project, which was specifically looking at uh, the issue of climate change and coastal heritage uh, and improved data gathering uh, in the coastal zones of Wales and Ireland. Uh, the project allowed both our organizations to develop leaps and bounds these technological uh, sort of areas of our work. They've left us with really important survey legacies. Uh, and our opening slide uh, just shows some of the fruits of our labor. Not a bad work day this in May 2022 uh, over County Kerry. Uh, high in Cessna, eight miles offshore to record Skellig Michael Monastery offshore here, a World Heritage Site and long monitored by Rob and his colleagues from the Discovery Program. And here we are with Gary Devlin on a wintry oh, autumn day, it was in County Cork in 2017. Uh, so the Cherish Project, it's an acronym, uh, Climate, Heritage and Environments of Reefs, Islands and Headlands, was a six-year EU-funded project, came to an end last year, and it had four key objectives. And among these really important uh, uh, sort of target objectives, really, to target data and knowledge gaps. We were working away from urban areas uh, where climate change priorities are high, so those rural parts of the coast uh, where we had very little geomatic data, often no LIDAR data, no 3D data. So we're trying to get away and out to these data and knowledge gaps, these remote coastal locations, to establish new, metrically accurate baseline data through a, a range of different techniques. And we're also looking at the coast edge from the terrestrial edge down into the inshore waters. The project was a, a really nice one to work on. We have four big partners ourselves, the Royal Commission in Wales, Aberystwyth University's Department of Geography and Earth Sciences. So we're working with geographers, which is brilliant, paleoenvironmental specialists, scientists, amazing people to be on an archaeological site with, the Discovery Program in Ireland, uh, who have always innovated in, in archaeological survey techniques, and the Geological Survey of Ireland as well. So Cherish is a joint nation project between Wales uh, and Ireland, and you can see our numbered study sites here in West Wales, and those in Eastern and Southwest Ireland, taking in a range of coastal baseline study sites uh, from island landscapes, Martello Towers, uh, medieval churches, and coastal promontory forts, to paleo-environmental sites, dune systems, inshore lagoons, and of course, undersea wrecks as well. So a key ethos from the start of the project was that wherever we were, whether one of my colleagues was on a, a shipwreck survey or I was flying in Anglesey, we were part of a single survey team for the six years. And that was really important. Wherever we were, we were one single survey team, and we were implementing a toolkit approach uh, to archaeological recording. Uh, and that way, deploying a range of techniques to cover this difficult and dynamic uh, sort of geographic area, the coast edge. Uh, now, leading up to the 2017 start of our project, the toolkit approach to recording had often been discussed, but I'm not sure if anybody really nailed it down. Uh, and so in Cherish, we sketched it up and then got it uh, drawn professionally. Uh, and this is the approach we had to our coastal recording of climate change impacts in Wales and Ireland. So from the, the coast edge, uh, and then the seashore area, and then the inshore waters, and taking in the difficult white ribbon zone, this area where we have a data gap between low water and then the limit of inshore survey vessels for bathymetric survey. You get a sort of data issue in the middle. We're very keen to join that up in seamless onshore, offshore recording. Uh, and everything you see in this diagram we implemented over the six years, whether it was contracted in uh, LIDAR and satellite imagery, or drone survey and aircraft, or a light aircraft survey that we're going to be talking about today. But then paralleling that with geophysical survey on the ground, paleoenvironmental coring. That's Dan at the back doing some topographic survey. We can recognize everybody in here. Uh, there's Ted, who can't join us today, unfortunately. Uh, and excavation, and then new uh, bathymetric surveys of shipwrecks. So it was an ambitious start. We coined this in 2015-16, and we deployed it during the project. 
Whenever I'm talking about flying nowadays, uh, I always show this slide at public talks. Because everybody asks, well, you know, if you've got a drone, what on earth are you doing flying around on an aircraft? Now, I'm a drone pilot in the Royal Commission as well. I've got my GVC qualification. Um, and they're both different survey techniques. We've had this today already. Uh, they both do different things. The aircraft, uh, at sort of visual flight rules, not able to fly through fog and cloud banks, take you about 130 miles an hour over the landscape on a good day, three to five hours flying time for regional or country survey. That's your first look at particular things that you can deploy photogrammetry in the air as well. Whereas the drone, uh, normally the little quadcopter style drone in the UK has a visual line of sight of 500 meters and a 400 foot limit. Uh, so much more restricted, but you can still do huge surveys with these. So it's different tools uh, for different purposes. Now aerial archaeology in Ireland has a long history, but a sporadic history. There's never been a national approach to survey in Ireland as such. But there's been some really big names, really big hitters, uh, who we owe a lot uh, to over the years. Leo Swan, Marcus Casey, and Con Brogan. Leo Swan's and Marcus Casey's uh, archives now digitized and available online. Uh, Marcus Casey's just recently gone up online. That was on Twitter the other day. Cambridge University have flown out in Ireland on a few sorties. Uh, but ours, our very own Dr. Gillian Barrett from Wolverhampton University, uh, did about 20 years of work in Ireland. Uh, crop mark recording, writing up articles for it, lecturing over there. And at the start of uh, Cherish in 2017, I went to see it at her home. This was her archive for Ireland on the shelf here. And that's now being transferred over to Ireland because of her involvement in Cherish. It's, it's good to see. There was a critical air and earth report by the Heritage Council in 2008 uh, showing the state of the nation for air, photog air photography in Ireland. Uh, and there's been more recent work now with drone discoveries 2018 uh, yielded lots of crop marks on blue sky imagery, and Anthony Murphy had his drone henge discovery near Newgrange. If you search drone henge, you'll come up with all that. Uh, so there's an enormous amount of potential in the Irish landscape for this type of work. We knew we wanted to deploy aerial survey in Ireland uh, uh, from Wales, what we knew in Wales, over to Ireland. It's highly responsive. You can get flying a few days after a storm. You can access remote sites and islands as well, uh, and it gives you a dated record of change. So a standard photograph from 1,500 feet here of Balance Gaelic's Abbey will show you sub-meter data on gravestones, stones and rocks on the beach, and the state of these harbor defenses, or these, uh, these coastal defenses here as well. So it remains a, a pretty good uh, technique for that first look at particular sites. Making it work, Ireland was well served with light aircraft and regional airports. So we'd make a booking two to four weeks out for a survey and then check that weather leading up to that flight date, whether I'd hop on a ferry or not to come over and meet Rob and Ted at the airport. Uh, but I'm pleased to say we, we did quite a lot in the project. We got 26 hours of joint nation air photography done. That's when I'm in the plane with my colleagues. Uh, and then uh, Rob and Ted were able to do some other surveys uh, as well. Uh, we got out in 2017 from Cork Airport the Atlantic Flight Training Academy with 20 Cessnas parked up on the runway, ready to go. Incredible. Uh, good service at County Waterford and Wexford on the coast. 2019, coastal Dublin and the east coast of Ireland here as well. And then County Kerry in 2022. And that's our stretch out to Skellig Michael there. Uh, we had the weather for it, which is fantastic. Um, it worked very well. We had about two days on site on average. And we contributed thousands of photographs uh, to the Irish archive. Uh, as a legacy. Some successes. Uh, in 2019, we were sort of tasked with making a new baseline, a bleak record of Dublin Bay, the islands in Dublin Bay. Uh, that's the Howth Peninsula, and we've got Lambie Island and other properties uh, offshore there. Uh, it's a difficult landscape. It's right under or right in the controlled traffic zone of Dublin International Airport, where we've got airliners taking off and landing. Uh, drone survey was challenging. The geological survey was kept trying to get out there. You need the weather and the boat owner and the landowner access to get out to each island in turn. Uh, so we made a booking on 20th March 2019 uh, and worked with the local air, uh, local pilot at Western Airport at Dublin, who regularly liaises with Dublin International for tourist flights over the city. And the morning of the flight, absolutely wonderful. Look at the look, windless March morning. When do you ever get a windless March morning? The beautiful clarity over the sea. 
and we were able to go in at 500 feet under Dublin International's airspace. So uh, it was a fantastic trip. Uh, and we were able to build a big new image archive of these offshore properties. Uh, we were able to get out five miles offshore to Rockerville Lighthouse, really nice new high resolution photographs of these uh, reefs and islands. Uh, powerful images like that, a rush here. Uh, this became a popular image, was exhibited in Dublin. Yeah, it really sums up quite wealthy housing development on a very vulnerable coastal peninsula. We've got a Martello Tower there from the 19th century as well. Really summing up some of the challenges with climate change in this dynamic environment. Uh, Dramana Coastal Promontory Fort, a famous site in Irish archaeology. And then sites like Shenick Island. We luckily had good visibility through inshore waters, so we can drop these colour images into Photoshop and strip out the colour bands. If you push the cyan band here, it almost drains the sea around. Really the only way to look at sort of coastal sites or coastal photographs. We we'll begin to pick out the harbourages, uh, fish traps and wrecks and so on in this way as well. Uh, so we're very pleased to get in there, get that weather window uh, and get these photographs banked. And we had other good uh, coastal surveys, particularly County Kerry in May 2022. Uh, the, uh, the Irish coast is generally privately owned. So if you want to deploy a drone out to some of these peninsulas, you have to liaise with individual landowners. And look how fragmented the Kerry coastline is. So the Cessna, again, a really good way for rapid access to this highly fragmented uh, island landscape with offshore peninsulas and so on as well. Uh, and you, know, you can still get a good shot with the plane if you're in a sort of 90 degree banking turn over Stag Fort, up a sort of uh, dry valley. Uh, really some interesting sites out there. So we're pleased with the results. Other aspects of our work, we're able to get a training school done in 2019, which linked a day conference with a two-day flying and drone school along the ARG model, the ARG workshop model. There's still not enough of these happening nowadays. We had 13 delegates from postgrads to professional staff here uh, with a morning ground school in interpretation and camera use and an afternoon, half an hour air experience as well. So it's a really good couple of days. Um, and, you know, handling a professional camera, not something many people are familiar with nowadays. Shutter settings, exposure settings, you know, image framing as well. With, in the land of mobile phones, it's quite a lot to get back to and work on. But we had a really good time. Um, and, you know, these are other things we can deploy more of, hopefully, uh, in the future as a way of spreading the word about how drones and flying work together. My last slide, just to say uh, that I think we've handed over a good legacy of those 26 hours of flying, thousands of new images which are now archived in Ireland. And then we can take those back to Jill Barrett's images from, 20, from 1991. This is the Copper Coast in Waterford, uh, my shot from October 2017. And we can begin to have that image archive of change because some of these sites are extremely fragile and will change rapidly. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Rob, uh, who's going to tell you about other aspects of the recording. Um, to start with, I'm just going to go back to Toby's slide here, which uh, just emphasizes the difference really between what Toby was doing with the airplane photography and what we were going to be using the drones for. So the drone survey, UAV drone, whatever we like to call it, I'm going to call it drone for this session, um, flies obviously at a lower altitude due to regulations, 120 meters. It also has the ability to be stationary, unlike the plane, so you're able to set yourself up for the images that you want and make sure you get the picture that you're after. So the first thing we would use them for regularly would be just simple site inspections and setting up photographs of monuments. So you'd be getting into a position where you could see the monument clearly. In this case, for us, Parag Mott, looking at some relatively uh, gradual erosion that's taking place there, almost a creep erosion that takes place on the, on the coast there. And in comparison, down below, Dinberg Fort in Kerry, the catastrophic failure of the cliff takes place from time to time, taking with it the the ramparts and, and the stone built structures. So this is um, really the difference is we're much lower, we're setting these shots up and we're able to create the record that we're after. Big advantage um, perhaps over the plane which is flying much higher. But that's not really the, the best use of the drone. Um, this is where it comes into more power I think is when we're working with architectural um, surveys where we're looking at elements of the architectural features that we're not able to get access to. 
this would be on Dolphy Island in Dublin Bay. And um, we're trying to do surveys, um, detailed 3D surveys using laser scanning and photogrammetry in order to get the tops to be able to use the images from the drone to supply very low bit detailed surveys which match and give a complete survey model at the end. But mapping from the air, I think, is the most important contribution the drones have made. And this has been a major part of the Cherish program in Ireland. Using drones to establish baseline data from which we can then measure future change. Mm -hmm. um, there are many different drones. Um, we experimented and Cherish with larger fixed wing drones with heavy duty cameras on. We used looked at uh, fixed wing drones, but in the end, settled on relatively cheap, versatile, um, and robust solution with the, the Phantom, the VGI Phantom series. Started off with the ordinary Phantom and then moved to the RT Play solution. So we were using ground control from GNSS. We continue to do that throughout this project just to keep continuity with the survey data that we produced. Um, in, in the field, it's relatively straightforward using the DJI Ground Station Pro app. Uh, this is where we set the, pri the parameters for the flights or the area, the flying height and the overlaps, which calculates the, the ground um, resolution, normally between one and two centimetres in the model. Um, more subtle but probably more important adjustments have to be made to the camera settings, uh, to balance lighting conditions, the need to minimise motion blur, ensure sharp images for us have been processing, something that really can't be emphasised enough, so we really need to have the right um, camera settings. Uh, so when we're happy, uh, the parameters are sent to the drone and the drone drops and flies the mission automatically. Um, the next step then is processing data. This example is Phil and Phil Bed uh, Ring Fort on the Irish Sea coast of, of Wexford. Um, the outcome of the survey is a series of overlapping vertical image, uh, photographs and a file of ground station control points ready for data processing. So during Cherish project, this was done in Agisoft Multishoot, following standard sequence of processes to in the screen, aligning the photos, importing the ground control, identifying the ground control point, and then building the elevation model, generate the auto image, and generate a mesh model. So these are the outputs that we have. And with these outputs, uh, standard outputs for photogrammetry would be the digital elevation model, high resolution, two centimetres with the associated auto image. So I've just enlarged the images there, which show us quite clearly that we have this very soft sediment coast collapsing into the sea with uh, regular intervals of, of collapse taking place. Uh, this baseline survey was established in November 2019. And then we followed that up in June 2021 with a repeat survey using identical flying parameters. So we ended up with a new auto image and digital elevation model, which were at the same resolution and the same net mapping system, allowing us to, to make these comparisons with the survey that was done 18 uh, months earlier. And that's the analysis that we're able to do. We do this in GIS at the time that we were using uh, ArcGIS for the Cherish project. We now do this work in QGIS. Um, a simple raster computation, subtracting the 2019 DM from 2021 DM, and that highlights the changes that have taken place. So we've had an area of, of, of large failure to the accretion below, but we also have um, areas of erosion taking place just through the general um, wave action and coastal action on, on the site. Um, the survey has not been repeated here. This was a cherished project, but the, the data is banked, the data is available, and it can be accessed um, by National Network Service, and I forget you read it into these sites. Um, for sites such as Doombeg Fort, with the near vertical cliffs, the, the GIS approach, the 2.5D approach, doesn't really work as satisfactorily. And the option here has been to look at the exported mesh model instead. Um, a little bit more like you would do a survey with a building. You include um, more brief photographs to create better models. And you're then able to do um, analysis, computations, this thing in, in 3D software and geomagic, which allows us to identify and even give some estimate of the volume of loss that's taken place on the site. This was uh, the impact of storm Ophelia in October uh, 2017. Uh, the final element, I suppose, of um, using the drones in Cherish was to capture video footage. Uh, so using a few basic approaches, uh, 
camera, even on a relatively low cost drone, will give you a high quality uh, video that can be used for outreach. So we use these, um, we took this from the internet, just suggestions of how to take individual shots rather than trying to do complex maneuvers with the drone to take smooth paths. So it's all in about editing and bringing together all the different pieces. So you can create the story by gathering different pieces of video. With a bit of editing and other additional images, we're able to apply narratives to these and quick and easy to make good outreach and educational uh, materials. Um, and this was done particularly through the, um, the lockdown of COVID. Uh, we put together videos um, as part of Heritage Week, um, when sites, visits, or face to face opportunities weren't really available. Um, so this was a, a replacement for the public engagement that we've normally have done. Um, this is just gathering together different sources. It's not all drone material, but with some of Toby's higher images of Uber, you put the, the narrative there. There, there was a, a, a running commentary that I switched that off in the case, but I'm going to cut out this now, as you've probably seen in the um, And that's really where we get to. We have all of our um, cherished best practice or good practice was put into a publication and there are still quite a few copies in Wales and in Ireland. Uh, if, if, if anybody wants a hard copy they can contact either organisations or you can download the um, publication online.